waves at in speed that didn't kill him. But his problems didn't end there with jellyfish stings, and he started to swallow seawater. He managed to swim to a life raft and remain afloat until a U.S. submarine eventually rescued him, but he vomited due to nausea from all the seawater that he swallowed. Bush wrote that he thought to himself, My God, this thing is going to blow up. When Bush was later rescued and expected, he found that he had a gash on his head and a bruise on his left eye. That's because when he jumped out of the plane, the wind struck him full force, essentially lifting him out the rest of the way when he was trying to get out of the plane and propelled him backward into the tail. His khaki flight suit was soaked and heavy, his head was bleeding, his eyes were burning from the cockpit smoke, and his mouth and throat were raw from the rush of salt water. When Bush was on the raft before he was rescued by the submarine, the wind was carrying him toward Chichijima, and he began to paddle furiously in the opposite direction, because he didn't want to be taken to a POW camp. Of the nine airmen who escaped their planes, Bush was the only one who survived, but he didn't think that he would. Bush later learned of the war crimes committed against American captives at Chichijima and POW camps, including cannibalism. His eight comrades were tortured and then beheaded or stabbed to death, according to one account. The body parts of former American pilots were cooked and eaten by Japanese officers. Others who didn't survive but weren't taken into POW camps include one crewman whose parachute apparently failed to open and the other who never made it out of the plane. Well, Bush was alone on the raft for hours. Bush, who later won a distinguished flying cross for heroism under fire, thought he was delirious when suddenly a submarine rose from the sea to rescue him. The Tribune men second class said, Welcome aboard, sir. And he replied, Happy to be aboard. So Bush managed to survive, and he was part of an aerial effort that was critical in the war effort in the Pacific theater. Air power was necessary to destroy the enemy's air power and the tactical support of operations on the ground or at the sea. Well, Bush wasn't done yet. He returned to the San Jacinto and continued to pilot torpedo bombers in several successful missions. Over the course of 1944, his squadron suffered a 300% casualty rate among its pilots. But Bush won three air medals as well as a presidential unit citation. Bush was reassigned in December 1944 to Norfolk Naval Base in Norfolk, Virginia, where he was tasked with training new pilots. He received an honorable discharge from the Navy in September 1945 after Japanese surrender. That's a combat experience of one president. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. In terms of the first president to actually fly as a sitting president, we have to look to Franklin D. Roosevelt, and it also has to do with World War II. And it happened in 1943 in preparation for the Casablanca Conference. This conference is remembered today for the agreement by FDR and Winston Churchill to demand unconditional surrender from the Axis powers. But before the leaders sat down to make this agreement, FDR took a trip across the Atlantic in a Boeing 314 flying boat, the first time a sitting president flew on a plane. Well, the pilots were surprised because they had no idea who was going to fly with them. The flights had been planned in secrecy. They didn't want it to be attacked. And when Roosevelt and his entourage showed up at the Pan American Airways in Miami on January 11th, 1943, the crew was very surprised to learn the identity of their guest. One of them was Pan Am pilot Howard M. Cohn Jr. He was a 34-year-old veteran of transoceanic flights. Cone flew Roosevelt, advisor Harry Hopkins, and several military leaders on one clipper, while another flying boat carried the presidential staff. Cone said FDR was an excellent passenger and a good air sailor, as he described it, on his 15,000-mile round trip, displaying impressive knowledge of geography on a journey that includes stops in Trinidad and Brazil. Once in Africa, Roosevelt boarded a TWA C-54, piloted by 35-year-old Captain Otis F. Bryan, who flew him from Gambia to Morocco. The trip back from Casablanca included a flyover of the harbor at Dakar, Senegal, at an altitude of 3,000 feet. After they returned, the War Department had a press conference, and the two air pilots couldn't stop talking about their VIP passenger's ability to make you feel perfectly at home. We felt at ease as long as he was, said Ryan. And it was a pretty festive event. The president celebrated his 61st birthday on the way back, He dined on olives, pickles, caviar, cake, and champagne. This actually wasn't FDR's first time in a plane, I guess I should point out. 
1932, he had flown to the Democratic Convention in Chicago to accept the presidential nomination. But before 1943, planes weren't really considered a safe form of transportation for a president. But despite that, Roosevelt flew, and his wife Eleanor was a veteran flyer by 1943 and had even gone up with one of the Tuskegee Airmen, the first all-black flight unit in the American military. And she wasn't the first presidential spouse to fly either. That distinction actually goes to Warren Harding's wife, Florence. Although when she went up in a Navy seaplane during a trip to Panama in November 1920, she was technically still a first lady elect. According to the Atlanta Constitution, during a visit to the Naval Air Station at Cocosolo, Mrs. Harding accepted an invitation to make a flight, spending 15 minutes over Limon Bay in one of the largest NC-type planes used by the Navy. The plane attained a height of about 1,000 feet, and though it was her first experience at flying, Mrs. Harding appeared to enjoy it immensely. While prospective presidents are forbidden the thrills of rescue ventures like skyplaning, nevertheless, Senator Harding carries back with him a vivid picture of the bay from the air recounted by Mrs. Harding. So again, flying at this time in the 20s and 30s is like skydiving or parasailing or free solo rock climbing, a pretty dangerous event if you don't know exactly what you're doing and you're not in very capable hands. And even if everything goes right, something terrible can still go wrong. Well, after Roosevelt's flight, there was an idea of designating specific military aircraft to transport the president so they wouldn't have to rely on commercial airlines because it was too much of a safety risk. A C-87 Liberator Express was reconfigured for use as the first dedicated presidential transport aircraft and named Guess Where 2, but the Secret Service rejected it because of its safety record. A C-54 Skymaster was then converted for presidential use, and this is what carried FDR to the Yalta Conference in February 1945, and the same plane was used for another two years by President Harry S. Truman. The Air Force One call sign was created after a 1953 incident during which a Lockheed Constellation named Columbine 2, carrying Dwight D. Eisenhower, entered the same airspace as a commercial airline flight, and it had the same flight number. Roosevelt's plane, the VC-54C, nicknamed the Sacred Cow, included a sleeping area, a radio telephone, and a retractable elevator to lift Roosevelt in his wheelchair. It was used by President Roosevelt only once before his death, during his trip to the Alta Conference and it's now on display at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force in Ohio. Truman used the same plane, and he signed the National Security Act of 1947 while on it. He replaced the VC-54C with a modified C-118 liftmaster called the Independence, which was Truman's hometown in Missouri. The aircraft had a distinctive bald eagle painted on the nose. Well, with Air Force One, this call sign was established for security purposes. The first official flight using the call sign Air Force One was in 1959 during the Eisenhower administration. Since then, every president has used flight. But there haven't been as many examples of presidents serving in military aviation. I mentioned earlier that George W. Bush, the son of George H.W. Bush, also served, but not in active combat. In 1968, George W. Bush joined the 147th Fighter Interceptor Group of the Texas Air National Guard which he committed to serve for six years until 1974, with two years active duty while training to fly and four years part-time duty. He began 54 weeks of flight training after six weeks of basic training, and in December 1969, he began 21 weeks of flight interceptor training. His first solo flight was in March 1970, and he graduated that summer. When he graduated, his commitment for two years active duty was fulfilled. Bush carried out part-time guard duty as a pilot through April 1972. He logged over 300 flight hours, and as a part-time National Guardsman, he volunteered his service to a number of assignments, including political campaigns. He was discharged honorably on October 1, 1973, from the Texas Air National Guard, Then he was then transferred to the inactive reserves in Colorado. His military service ended when he was discharged from the Air Force Reserves in 1974. Now, his service was with controversy. During the 2004 presidential campaign, There were political issues regarding his time in the Texas National Guard, and there were questions of whether he fulfilled his requirements of his military service contract, whether he had had preferential placement in the National Guard so he wouldn't actually have to serve in Vietnam, and why he lost his flight status. But that's beyond the scope of this episode. Now I want to return to an issue that I mentioned at the top of this episode on a question of whether aviators make better leaders. 
This was a question asked by Barrett Tillman, aviation historian. I read a book of his called On Wave and Wing, The Hundred Year Quest to Perfect the Aircraft Carrier. It talks about how he thinks that the aircraft carrier is probably the most significant piece of military technology when it comes to power projection in the 20th century and even in the 21st century, because now you can take your Air Force anywhere you want to on planet Earth. So all I'd say, he knows a thing or two about aviation. Anyway, what he notes is that few countries have produced as many flying commanders in chief as the United States, along with George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and others. But it's not only the United States that had aviators turn leaders. For example, the British royal family. George V, king from 1910 to 1936, was photographed in Royal Air Force uniform with only honorary wings. Three of his heirs earned pilot ratings, however. His second son, Prince Albert, saw combat in the Royal Navy, then entered the RAF in 1918 as a non-flying officer. After World War I, he trained to fly. Albert's older brother, Edward, and younger brother, George, also became pilots. Edward inherited the throne in 1936 and established the King's Flight at Hendon, where he became Britain's first reigning monarch to fly as passenger and pilot. When Edward abdicated to marry an American divorcee, Albert succeeded with the name George VI. More recently, Prince Charles earned his wings in 1971, then qualified in helicopters in 1974. His son, Prince William, has flown in the RAF and the British Army, primarily as a pilot on search and rescue choppers. Charles' brother Andrew flew Sea King helicopters from HMS Invincible in the 1982 Falklands War and continued flying until 1996. Other heads of state that were pilots include Ian Smith, the former Prime Minister of Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, from 1965 to 1979. He was based in Egypt in 1943 when he crashed on takeoff in his Hawker Hurricane. After reconstructive surgery, Smith was recertified and owing to damage in his left eye, offered an instructor's post. But he preferred combat missions and flew Spitfighters with the number 237 squadron out of Corsica. He fought German forces in Italy's Po River Valley in 1944, but Smith was hit by flak and bailed out. He spent five months with the underground helping coordinate Allied air operations before embarking on a 23-day trek over the Alps to safety. King Hussein bin Talal of Jordan Another leader with flight experience is Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, who graduated from the country's military academy at 20 in 1949. He entered the Air Academy and took the standard curriculum of flying, along with scientific and technical courses. He flew fighters, then bombers. Egypt got a lot of its operational training from the Soviet Union, where Mubarak qualified on what NATO called Beagles, and later TU-16 Badgers. He was an instructor and a unit commander, and in 1964, headed a military delegation to Moscow. There are probably other politicians and heads of state that I'm leaving now, but that gives you an idea of a few of those people. So the question on how it affects their leadership style, that's hard to nail down. But what I will say is that when I was doing a series called Presidential Fight Club with James Early, we looked at all 44 U.S. presidents and we did a tournament like the NCAA basketball tournament where they all fight each other one on one. We took factors into account like military experience, height, weight, any other special skills or qualities that would allow them to win, such as Eisenhower being an amateur boxer, Warren G. Harding have a terribly unhealthy diet that would probably make him roll over and crumple, Abraham Lincoln being his county's wrestling champion, and other factors like that. I think that one of the great dark horses of that contest was George H.W. Bush, and I think the reason is that he had incredible tenacity. You wouldn't really think of that if you knew of George H.W. Bush when he was president. He was thought of and sometimes mocked as this grandfatherly, wimpy, frail figure who was this sort of passive New England personality, a rich patrician. But I argued that he should not be underestimated, partly because of his uh, CIA advanced interrogation techniques that he might have, but his abilities and his tenacity and his bravery as a fighter pilot flying over 50 missions when many others after 30 missions would be burnt out, maybe afraid to continue flying because of the persistent danger that took place. So there are many ways that national leaders would be able to develop courage, whether in the military or whether elsewhere. But with the danger of flying, I think it can be argued that it forms and sharpens character in a way that few other activities can't. All right. Well, that is all for this episode on presidents who take to the skies.
I'd like to thank Todd for the question. And if any of you have questions for me, please feel